Well, good morning or again, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Learn Restore in this edition of the Flood Files webinars. Uh, I'm Darren Foote, and I'll be presenting today on the categories of water damage. So we're very glad you're here. Uh, this is also set up as an ICRC uh, continuing education uh, course, and so we'll have information on that a little bit later on. As we're going through, as this is a webinar, we do have it set up as a, uh, we don't have the chat available, but we do have a Q&A. So we've got a few questions that were sent in prior to the webinar where people sent in when they registered. Uh, thank you for that, of course. And then uh, in addition to that, uh, you can do Q&A through. We've got a lot of information to get through today. So if you throw the Q&A up, we'll get to it either during class, if I see it pop in, or toward the end, we'll have time as well. So please, if you got questions on things, We'll do the best we can to uh, to move forward. So uh, as we're talking about categories of water, that this is a big topic, a lot to cover today. Uh, as we do, we'll be talking about the IICRC. So everything we talk about today is based on the II, the ANSI IICRC S500, which is the standard uh, for professional water damage restoration. And so as we talk about that, I just want to give a very brief introduction to the IICRC and their purpose, as well as a brief history of the S500. So uh, the IICRC, as it says on the slide, is the, uh, the Institute of Inspection, Cleaning, and Restoration Certification. And their purpose is to create uh, standards for all sorts of different industries, carpet cleaning, textile cleaning, illicit drug cleanup, uh, trauma cleanup, uh, HVAC duct cleanup after some sort of, a, of an event. And the one that we're dealing with is water damage, which is the S500, as I just uh, mentioned. They also do certifications. And so based on those standards, the IICRC, the volunteers, and those are at the IICRC will create course content and curriculum, and then certification courses based on that. And it really is worldwide. Pretty much anywhere you go, your certification that you have through the IICRC uh, or your standards that you use are pretty universally accepted all over the place. So it's good to know them and have them. The S500 is, uh, as we look at it quickly, I'm going to talk a little bit about the S500, also talk about uh, the process for a standard becoming a, not just a standard, but an ANSI standard and what that means and why we do it that way. And so the S500 is written by a group, it's called the consensus body, and they get together and you'll have in that consensus body, restoration professionals and insurance professionals and uh, technician level and owners of companies uh, adjusters and agents, uh, equipment manufacturers, chemical formulators, just a broad spectrum of people from three interest groups that have a stake in what's happening with our industry and what the standard would say, and to make sure that the standard of care really does represent what and the, the, what it says in the, in the S500 is what prudent members of the trade are doing in the field. And so that's really what we're looking at. And so uh, as we go through that, the first time, uh, first publication was in 1994. And we had a lot of people coming in as contractors and their clients were saying, hey, I know you're rebuilding my fire, you're fixing my water damage, uh, but I actually had the water damage. Can you come clean it up? And they'd show up and extract the water. You had carpet cleaners who were cleaning carpet and their, and their client would call and say, hey, our pipe just broke and I knew you've got that machine that extracts a lot of water real fast. Can you come out and do it? But it was starting to become its own industry where it was really starting to become uh, a water damage industry and not something that other companies did. And so the, the first edition is about a quarter of an inch thick, uh, standard and reference guide in 1994, great information by a lot of pioneers in our industry that got together uh, and put that there. That was revised in 1999 for the second edition, about three eighths of an inch thick, a little bit more information in the, in the reference guide. The standard was still about 18 pages uh, as was in 94. The, some big changes happened in the third edition in 2006. One is the content. So the book is now about an inch or so thick. It's got about 88 pages of actual standard language. And the rest of it is, is a really good information on the reference guide. And uh, But something else even more significant happened than just the amount of content and the quality of content that was put in that edition was that it, it received what's called ANSI accreditation. And that's a huge deal. And so we'll jump over for a moment as we talk about ANSI. But the ANSI accreditation says, here's the process that someone went through to become accredited uh, or received through ANSI. And so jumping very quickly, uh, the IICRC is an, an accredited ANSI standards developer. Uh, Millie Washington is and Cheryl there are in charge of that and they make sure that everything is followed for every consensus body through this process. ANSI basically doesn't care what's in the book. <laughs> they, they are not water damage professionals or mold or carpet cleaners. Uh, you might have a pair of safety glasses that says on the side ANSI. They didn't make those glasses. 
It just means that those glasses meet their requirements that hopefully they'll protect your eye with those, you know, with the minimum standards that are, that are on those glasses. Same thing with, with the S500. ANSI doesn't go through and go, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, nope, no, no. They just simply say, did you follow the process? Did you go through what needed to be done to make sure that everyone had a voice, that it's not just somebody saying, if I write this book, I'll make a lot of money because I'm gonna put this in there and that's what I do. And so the consensus body, typically over a course of several years, will, the, and another way to say that is the authoring body, and they will put together the document with subcommittees, a lot of volunteers, a lot of hours into this, and they'll put it together. And then when they feel good about the document and they voted on it, it goes out for a public peer review. Anybody can get a draft copy and make comments and say, you know, this section here seems dumb and the way you wrote that doesn't make sense and I totally disagree. And then when those hundreds of comments come in, uh, everybody, uh, every comment has to be individually accounted for through the consensus body. So I'll go through every one of those comments and sometimes they'll say, uh, we see what you're saying. We disagree. We're going to leave it like it is. And sometimes the consensus body will say, wow, we see what you're saying and you've given a really good argument. We understand what you're saying. We're going to change the language and we're going to change it to what you said. And sometimes they'll say, that's a great, we're, we're still looking into that and trying to get some more information on that. Well, we're probably going to kick that down the road to the next consensus body as we take a look at that. As it goes through that process, if the consensus body makes what's called a substantive change, then that has to go back out for another peer review. It, I believe if it's less than five pages and it's just those five pages, if it's more than five pages, the entire document goes back out again. Uh, I, I think that the 2015 S500 went through five or six peer reviews before it was finally um, set up. And then after all that, there's an appeals process through ANSI, again, not on what's in the document, but on... Uh, the process was it really followed correctly. So the, the bottom line is once it gets this ANSI accreditation stamp, this becomes the document. If heaven forbid you ever wind up in some sort of a dispute with a with a client, with an insurance company or insurance company with a client, uh, this document is designed to serve the entire industry uh, uh, or whoever it might be, this is the document you're going to turn to and say, this is why I did these things. Or where someone's going to say, you did it incorrectly. Why didn't you do these things like it says right here in the S-500? So the ANSI is a very, very important part of this document. It was first received in, in uh, the third edition in 2006. And subsequently, we've maintained that the ISRC has maintained that accreditation. So the next edition came out in 2015. Uh, fourth edition, also ANSI. The most current edition came out in 2021, May of 2021. Uh, th at that point, the reference guide was removed. There is an appendix with some information in there, three appendices, but the, the general reference guide has been removed to come out at a later date. Uh, and the consensus body actually for the next edition has is, is already started the process. It's just an, it's a revolving. ANSI says they would like to have it every five years reviewed, updated, make sure that with the current information and process are in place. Uh, and if it goes longer than that, if it goes 10 years, they'll pull the accreditation. But five years is that window that we shoot for. So it's it's back going through it again. Um, I will say very quickly before we get into it, as since today is about the categories, we're pulling out that section and talking about what's in the S-500. And in some ways, what's not in the S-500. Uh, from 2006 to 2015, the third to the fourth edition, there was very little change in categories. The, the information... I, I uh, will get to that in a few minutes, but I believe um, from category one and two is the same definition and category three, uh, it changed from beyond the trap to beyond any trap. And uh, in you know, 2006 to 2015, it removed ground surface water. I, I might have some other notes as I come up, but there was there haven't been big changes in the language since at least 2006. And from the 2015 to the 2021 edition, in 2015, the, the, the categories of loss were actually in the document four different times, and there were three different versions. It was a clerical error. And so the first one was the one that was intended, and that was carried over to the 2021. So other than clarifying which, edition, which version was correct, there have been no differences uh, between 2015 and 2021. I have a feeling in the next one, there'll be a very big discussion point. There's a, just a lot of documentation. So uh, this is important. Fifth edition states in the beginning that this supersedes any other, you know, doesn't matter what it said in the first, fourth, uh, second, third edition, those are those are gone. It's now the fifth edition and whatever the current standard is, is the current standard. Um, having said that, when I get, you know, when I'm reviewing a file or doing expert witness work or whatever it might be, and they say, hey, this job was done in 2018. Well, you can't use the 2021 standard for a job as 2018. The standard at the time was the 2015 standard. 
so sometimes we'll go back, but on any job going forward, it would be the most current standard uh, that you're using. So you need to know the standard. If you're doing professional water damage restoration or anything else in our industry, carpet cleaning, all those other things, you need to have that standard to be doing it. Um, you can buy them directly from the ICRC as a paper copy. You can get them online as a subscription. Um, scan that code real quick, take you right to their spot. The subscription has all the standards and it has all versions of all the standards. Uh, I, th I want to say it's roughly about $200 a year to the ICRC. Uh, so you're aware of that, but it's a great thing. There's some uh, language in the standard that you need to be aware of. Oftentimes, the first two are called trigger words. I'll start with shall, should, and recommended. These are very important words, and they're defined particularly for how they're utilized in the standard of care. And so when we look at this, shall, it says if it says shall, then that means it's it's you got to do it, right? It's either mandatory uh, to, to law or to regulation or to natural law, right? So shall, if I jump up in the air, I shall come back down. Law of gravity, nothing I can do about it. It's always going to happen. And so an example of a shall, appropriate safety procedures and personal protective equipment, PPE, shall be used to protect restores. No wiggle room there. If you need PPE, you got to be an appropriate, proper PPE. So that's a shall. You got to do it. That's just the way it is. Should means that if it says should or should not, that is part of the standard of care. The consensus body said, and the, and, the, and the peer review process has said, yes, this is needs to be done. This is appropriate. And so this is how it would be done by prudent restorers. And so an example of that, following a category, these are just examples I pulled out of the standard, following a category two water intrusion, carpet, cushion, pad, underlay, should be removed and discarded. So I can read into that, that if it's a category one loss, I can save the cushion, which many companies do. A lot of people rip it out, some dry it in place. And if it's a category one loss, either one of those is an appropriate according to the standard process. But once it's category two, that's no longer an option. The pad needs to be removed uh, and taken out. We'll talk in a moment about when you can, uh, when you should and shouldn't, I guess, or what you should do if you decide to deviate from the standard of care. If you say, you know what, I'm, I know what it says. I'm going to do something different. My client wants a different approach. Uh, we'll get there. Recommended is not uh, as it says, the practice is advised, it's suggested. The consensus body felt it was important to say, here's a consideration you might run across, not part of the standard of care. And so if you, if it, no, an example, it is recommended that area rugs and tapestries be cleaned at an in-plant facility by a specialized expert. But if you have the qualifications and you want to do it on site, that's okay. That's just a recommendation. So good information, but it's not a deviation from the standard if you don't follow that. There's some other language in there as well called may and can, and those have particular meanings within the standards. May says that it's permissive. Yeah, you can do that. Not right or wrong, not standard of care, not not standard of care. That's probably not correct grammar. Um, but uh, so for example, restorers may use dry standards to determine where the affected areas are. You may do that. If you look in the S500, there's other ways you can do that as well, uh, which we talk about in the NWRT. Uh, so that's a may, you, it's possible. You're welcome to do that if that's how you wanna do it, which we typically do. Can says that it's it's possible. Yeah, that, that's an option, not necessarily standard or not, but it's an option that would probably work. And I'm going to give you a couple of different examples of can because it is an important word that we use in there. So it's a possibility open to the user of the document, as it says on the slide. If the preliminary determination is that the water is category one, then the restorer can proceed without contamination controls. We're going to read a little bit later on that that means you don't have to put up a containment. You don't have to put in a pressure differential or negative air. You can extract the water, do your initial pre-cleaning and start to dry the place out. Whether or not that's what you're going to do and you know maybe some reasons you might not ought to do it that way, that's fine. But according to this, if it's category one job, you can get in and get going on it without, there's no, category one we're gonna talk about is not a contaminated issue. So you can start the drying process. A couple more examples. Restores can use the installed HVAC heating, ventilating, air conditioning system as a resource provided contaminants will not be spread. Okay, so yeah, you can do that. If, if it works for your job, you're not gonna be blowing category three, you know, aerosolized uh, soils around or mold or whatever. Sure, yeah, you could use the HVAC if it will help and if it's designed for that and won't cause other issues. One more example, following a category two water intrusion, restorers can consider on location drying of carpet after proper cleaning. So category two, it's telling me I can save carpet. It has to be cleaned properly, but that is an option that I have is to save that carpet and dry it in place. The idea behind the, one of the ideas behind the S500 is that it's common ground. There's many stakeholders and a lot of money that's involved in our industry. And so you've got, 
you know, building owners, you've got restoration contractors trying to make a profit and create jobs and do all the important things that, that we do. You've got insurance companies that are trying to take, you know, watch their bottom line, take care of their client and do all the things that they do. And the S500 hopefully is a way we can come together and say, this is the way it should be done. This is what ought to happen. As we talked a little bit about the S500, one of the things that I want to point out, uh, <laughs> so this is, this is kind of silly. Um, this as I ask this in my classes oftentimes, say, so what is this? And the, the response I get the most often are, it is a mosquito eater. It's a mosquito hawk or it's a skeeter eater. I was raised, not like I was, I was told as a kid by someone, don't, don't kill those, they eat mosquitoes. My whole life, I believed that this is a mosquito eater. And yet, as I look at it now, I realize <laughs> I was incorrect. This is actually called a crane fly. And there's some other names, mayfly, some other names out there, depending on you know where you are in the country. Uh, but these don't eat mosquitoes. And I didn't know this until I thought, of, I was trying to think of an example of something. I thought, what is something I believed I was told and I'm really not sure of? And so I looked this up a couple of months ago. So my whole life, I've thought these are mosquito eaters and they're not. I've pretty good marketing on their part for people to leave them alone. You know, I tell people we kill mosquitoes, I back off. Uh, but that's not what they do. My point is this happens all the time with the S500, where someone with, maybe with good intentions, maybe not, where someone says, um, the S500 says this. And so therefore we're going to take this action. Well, either they heard it from someone who believed it, but they trust them. And so now they believe it, or it's from a previous edition. I see that happen a lot where people quote, I, I, uh, just the other day where someone's saying, well, you know, if it's in this percentage point, then it's wet. Well, that's what it said two, two versions ago, but it doesn't say that anymore. And so make sure that you understand what it says. I personally think that anytime you hear the words on Facebook or whatever else, the S500 says, or according to the S500, that the next thing you should see is quotation marks. Uh, and that it's actually a quote from what's in there. Uh, and be very careful on that. I, this is just a side note I wasn't planning on saying, but I, I looked at a quote once on, on a Facebook uh, post and someone had said, the, the topic was AFDs. When can we use them? Why don't they pay for them? And all that. And uh, someone said, well, in the S500, according directly from the S500, and then had a, this quote in quotes. This is what the S500 says. And a bunch of people said, oh my gosh, I didn't know it said that. That's amazing. I'm thinking to myself, it didn't say that. Because what they did was they took the first part of a section, they dropped off a sentence and a half, went to the reference guide, got some more information, put it on the bottom and made it look like it was directly out. And my concern is someone else would see that and go, that's a great quote. And without referencing it to the S500 would copy and paste it under their documentation. And if that goes to court, I'm not an attorney, but you could be really in trouble when you cite the S500 and say, this is why I charged money for something when indeed it's not even in that document. So know it yourself, learn it yourself and understand what it is. The first principle of water damage according to the S500 is safety. Provide for safety. As it says, if you're going into a structure with contamination, you need to have proper protection before you do that. Safety, that's about as much as we're going to talk about safety. That's a whole other webinar, but that underlies everything we talk about today, especially when we get into the category two and category three information. So let's start with definitions. Categories of water. Now, I'm going to go through and I'm talking today about the words that are in the S500. I uh, understand that there's a lot of discussion, argument, and contention out there about, about what it is. It doesn't discuss every scenario. It says, here's some, here's some you know, information that hopefully will help and get you there. But there's a whole lot of room for discussion and interpretation. Uh, and a lot of people have very different conversations. And we could go much farther than this, but it's, it's very critical. The categories of water, as defined by this document, refer to the range of contamination, both in originating source and what happens after context materials. So in other words, where did the water come from? Was it rain? Did that rain come through the attic? Did it come through a window? Was it a broken pipe, a supply line? Was it a disposal backup? Was it a toilet backup? Once that originated, where did it go? What did it flow through? You know, is, is it a typical residence? Is it a veterinary clinic? Is it a hoarder's home? You know, what is it? What, what, what did it flow through? How long did it sit there? The longer it sits, the worse it gets. And, uh, and how long has it been sitting there? And what's the temperature been? And so as we look at that, we say, okay, time and temperature can affect or retard amplification, uh, thereby changing its category or affecting its category. So as I mentioned a moment ago, time is always our enemy. Time's always, a, it never helps us. It always makes things worse when it comes to water damage. Temperature could go either way. I've had jobs where it's the middle of the summertime and it's just, you know, it's so warm outside and humid and it's just really helping things grow and get bad and get worse and deteriorate. 
I've also got called into jobs where someone came home from winter vacation, Christmas vacation. They walk in the door and to save money, they turn their furnace off and a pipe broke. They come home and turn it back on and it's just ice all the way. I mean, literally ice. Well, microbes aren't growing in ice very well. So that's going to actually help. It's going to retard or slow down or inhibit that potential microbial growth uh, that's going forward. There's a term called preliminary determination, preliminary determination, say that one time slow, in the S500. And really all it means is what's the category? Uh, it's a process the restorer goes through to say, what is the category? And then at that point uses that to determine scope of work, personal protective equipment, all the things that will happen based on the category of le or level of contamination. Uh, so the preliminary determination is what is the category of water? And this is gonna have a huge impact as I just mentioned on what do we do? What do we tear out? How much do we have to clean? PPE, what repairs, whatever I tear out, it's gotta get put back together. That's gonna always increase the cost and the processes and everything. And so it really is, um, I, I have made comments before my classes, not about this so much, but just where you're saying, I can't imagine how much money has been spent incorrectly over the years because of things that were torn out that didn't need to be. Because someone put their meter on the corner beat on the drywall and it beeped and said, well, it's beeping and tore it all out, even though it didn't have to be. I, I, I didn't know of a job where they put their infrared camera on the wall and the bottom two feet was blue, so they tore it out, which was good because it was wet. Around every air conditioner in hundreds of units, they tore out two feet. It wasn't wet. It was cold. <laughs> and so understand what it is. I also can't imagine the huge amount of money that gets spent because people leave stuff in that they shouldn't have and it deteriorates and rots out. And it gets bad. And so there's just so much money involved. And when it comes to category, uh, it, it's huge. I, I've got a, a respected colleague who, when he saw I was doing this, made some comments, sent in some information. And he just said, he goes, this is huge. I, I have the direct quote on another slide, but he said, this is billions of dollars that we're talking about here on categorization of water and 100% correct. Uh, and so it's, it's just a huge deal. We have three categories of water. Uh, now, if you've ever had a motorhome or an RV, or probably even if you haven't, you're familiar with the terms clean water, gray water, and black water. We don't use those in our industry. There's still some allusions to it. There were in the S500 for quite a while. My feeling on that uh, is, is this. If I'm in a motorhome and I go to the sink and I turn on the faucet and get water in my glass, that's clean water. That's designed to be consumed. And I, if I drink that, it's not going to hurt me. You can make soup with it, whatever. That's clean water. I'm all good with that. No, no risk of, of being contaminated by that. If I wash my hands in the sink, I got, I've been outside working, whatever. I got some, you know, my hands are dirty. I'm doing dishes, whatever. Wash my hands in the sink and the soap and the dirt goes down the drain. It goes to the gray water tank. If I were to somehow accidentally consume the water in that gray water tank, would it put me in the hospital? Maybe. Would it kill me? Probably not. Would it make me sick? Very good chance that it could, you know, at least give me a stomach ache for a couple of days or, you know, disagree with my system and make me and make me ill. People who use the toilet goes into the black water tank. And if someone consumed the water in that black water tank, without a doubt, they're probably going to wind up in the hospital and potentially it could kill them. And so that does go along with the categories. And I think it's kind of a good way to explain that. Uh, but we want to understand that the what the water looks like is not always what the water is. You can have pristine, beautiful, crystal clear water that could kill you. And so, you know, it can make you sick all the way up to dead, as we say. And so we don't use that. We use categories. We've got category one. We're going to define all of these per the S500 here in just a moment. We have category two, and then we have category three. And so that is just category one, two, and three that we're talking about. The definitions per the S500. Category one comes from a sanitary source, clean water source. I'm, I want to point out the word there is source. It starts out clean. You know, came from a supply line, uh, doesn't pose substantial risk from exposure. Now, there's a little more words in the actual S500. I, you can see by the dot, dot, dot that I'm, you know, trying to shorten up a little bit for this presentation. But I've been very careful, in my opinion, that the dot, dot, dots and the, and the uh, truncation has not in any way altered the meaning of, of, the dot, of what it's trying to say. Examples can include. Now, I want to point out there's other places in the document where it says examples can include, and it gives examples of something that are all definitely included. I've kind of looked at this and said, these are examples. Other people look at it and say, no, these can be examples, but not necessarily. And so just understand, we'll talk more about that because that really becomes an issue on category three, two to a degree, one, not so much. So examples could be a broken supply line. Well, yeah, the water that's going to the sink, to the ice maker, to uh, uh, the toilet, doesn't matter. That water is going to be considered clean. 
uh, you know, it's not hurt anybody if it comes out initially. Tub or sink overflow with no contaminants, melting, melting snow or ice or falling rainwater. I get rained on, I don't run to the hospital, right? I'm not worried about that. Now, if the rain comes through the ceiling and into the attic and there's a bunch of, of uh, bat guano and pigeon poop or whatever up there, yeah, that's going to have an impact on the category. That's not, you know, that's, that's not the source that's coming through. Uh, broken toilet tanks. You can see the crack in the tank right here. That's, that is considered part of the, uh, supply line to the toilet. And so initially that would be considered category one. Toilet bowls with no contaminants or additives. And so, uh, you know, and people say, well, once you use a toilet, it's gonna have some contaminant. I get that argument. I don't wanna get too deep in that right now, but uh, that's, I mean, theory, somebody just finished cleaning the bowl with Clorox and then for some reason the tank overflowed, I guess, you know, or you just bought the thing uh, from the <laughs> supply house and you just installed a brand new toilet. But that's what the standard is telling us. Now, again, that's where it starts. I could have a broken toilet tank and I'm going to say, well, that's a category one, uh, but there could be other contributing factors. This one's pretty disgusting. Uh, actually, I just took this picture about four days ago. I was uh, looking at this. This toilet was clogged up. We're looking at it. And I popped off the lid and full of uh, microbes in there and this yucky sheen on the water. So, again, you look at the at the at the whole point right there. Uh, let me just look at one thing right here that I thought I had adjusted and just jump right there. I want to point out, and I know there's some people who, although they might disagree with me, I'm just going to, this is the way I look at it. I hear a lot of people, I see a lot of people on Facebook say there's no such thing as a category one job. You wouldn't want to drink that water once it touches the floor, the carpet, whatever. It's just not there. It tells us the categories as defined by this document. And so there is a category one. If, if the S500 gets to define it, other people don't get to redefine it. There is a category one. Whether you might think no jobs, <laughs> whether you think no jobs ever meet that criteria, that's a, that's a different conversation. It states that, yes, well, category one can deteriorate, without a doubt. We all know that, I hope. But it says category one water that flows into an uncontaminated building does not constitute an immediate change in category. I'm going to give a quick example on this. Um, my house is well-maintained. We have a dog, so we vacuum often. But I'm on the carpet all the time, playing with the dog, reading with my grandkids, playing a game with my grandkids all the time. And uh, and we we vacuum it a lot during the week, and we have it professionally cleaned periodically. And if I came home to my, I, I know it's not, you know, I, it's a typical. We walk in and out with our shoes. I get all that. If I had a supply line that failed, and my carpet in my house was soaking wet, and knowing my carpet like I do, I walked in and fell down and tripped, and I scooped up some of that water in my mouth. I wouldn't enjoy it. I wouldn't want to drink with my pizza, and I wouldn't call nine one one. I would not feel like my health was in great you know, in, gra in grave concern at that point. And on a typical water job, I'm going to go and extract the water and do my preliminary cleaning. Now, I, I've been in homes where clearly they have changed out of transmission or it's been a living room. And if I got that water in my mouth, I would be very concerned. But just because water touches the back of drywall or touches carpet, according to the S500, does not automatically change it. Now, again, I've got a respected colleague who's an IEP. We'll talk about what that is in a moment. And he goes, I've tested lots and lots of jobs. And in his opinion, less than 1% clarify, qualify that. I, in my experience in the field, I've had many times where I felt like, no, this is a category one job and I'm comfortable taking these precautions, extracting, drying, cleaning, cleaning, extracting, drying, and then cleaning again when I'm done. Uh, so just be aware. That's what it, that there, there is absolutely a category one job. Category two contains significant contamination and has the potential to make you sick if you get it in you or on you or through you. Uh, can contain potentially unsafe levels of microorganisms or their nutrients. Sorry, that jumped too soon. Some examples, discharge or overflow from a dishwasher or washing machine, right? I've got all the, the dirt on the, on the clothes. I've got the food on the dishes. I've got the detergents I'm using. A uh, great question that came in from one of the participants before the seminar today said, what if it's in rinse cycle? Which I thought that's interesting. I'm sure there was a conversation. It was in rinse cycle on the washing machine. Well, what's it rinsing? The whole reason of the rinse cycle is to rinse out the, you know, the, you put the detergent in as a surfactant to break the bond of the, you know, of the soils and to and it, you know, amend the water, and then the rinse cycle takes it all out. So yes, I would say if there's a washing machine overflow, it's going to be a, a category two. Overflow from the toilet bowl on the room side of the trap with some urine, but no feces. Uh, we'll talk about bacteria here in just a little bit. So I, when I say no feces, again, does that mean that there's any residue I can't see on the bowl from it being used prior? I don't see it that way. I see this thing as actual fecal matter in the bowl from someone, you know, on the on the paper, whatever that might be there. Um, on the room side of the trap, we'll talk more about that with category three. Seepage from hydrostatic pressure, broken aquariums, which 
Again, you've got fish poop, so I can't quite, you know, it, to me, that's about as close to a three as you can get without being a three. And I don't think it's going to take long to get their punctured water beds where people never clean them. And there's just a lot of bacteria and gunk in there. So that's category two and the different examples. But it's, again, don't downplay category two. It is significant contamination. It does have the potential to make you sick. And so we want to keep an eye on that. Category three, the fun stuff by definition grossly contaminated and can contain pathogenic, toxigenic, and other harmful, icky, yucky, yucky, gross, nasty, disgusting things. I'm paraphrasing a little bit there. Uh, it can cause severe, even death, you know, severe health reactions or death uh, if we are not careful around it and, and get it in us or on us. Uh, sewage, yeah, obviously you think. Wasteline backflows that originate from beyond any trap. So what I want to show you here, here's, here's the trap This we're talking about. Let me just go a little bit more of why it's any trap instead of the toilet trap, like it used to say. So the idea of the trap is to uh, capture gases. So I've got my, the water drains out of here, the gases vent out and the water comes down the drain right here. And so if, you know, if someone uses the toilet right here, it goes down into the, into the drain. If someone runs water through the sink, it goes down and it mixes into the drain. If someone runs water through the tub, it goes down through the trap and mixes into the drain. Once it gets down here, it's all mixed up together. And so if something, Thing. Now, I want to point out it says originates from beyond the trap. The trap itself over here, if you've ever cleaned one of those out, it is gross. It's just this gray, sludgy, smelly. It, that's not what it's talking about. Could that be category three? Potentially. This very clearly says originates from beyond the trap, meaning some event pushed it back this direction up through the toilet or up through the tub or up through the sink. And so it's originating from beyond. So it's all mixed together. And it goes on to say, and so just, you know, this, this is water from beyond the trap. I don't care if it's in the tub. That's definitely category three water. And so it also goes on to say, uh, regardless of visible content or color, because a lot of times it might come out from beyond the trap. Now, I don't think anybody has any doubt that sewage is category three, but you'll run into a lot of jobs where the question is not, is, is sewage category three? It's, is that really sewage? Did it come from the bowl? Did it come from beyond the trap? Where did it come from? Uh, and so that's where you'll probably have a specialized expert like a plumber coming in to make some determinations on that. All forms of flooding from seawater, rising water, rivers, and streams. So you've got a big aquarium, which is already gross, bacteria, fish poop, all that kind of stuff. Crest the bank, comes across the ground, it's picking up fertilizers and animal fecal matter and all sorts of other nasty stuff. Usually by the time the river overflows, the, the sanitary sewer system in the community is also overwhelmed and that's all mixing in together and it's just a big disgusting mess. Uh, so even though, you know, if I've got a house on this side of the street that's just full on sewage backup and a house on this side of the street that's a river backflow or a river overflow, this one's probably worse. That might look and smell worse, but this one's got everything and more that that one has. So just be very cautious with that. This is one that there's a lot of discussion on going on. Um, other contaminated uh, water entering or affecting the indoor environment, such as wind driven rain from hurricanes, tropical storms, or other weather-related events. And so it doesn't just mean, oh, it's a windy, rainy night. It's raining, which is category one initially, and it's blowing it in through the window. This is specifically saying wind-driven rain from a category. Had a question saying, well, what if it's near a bayou? Well, that's, it's, not, it's not about whether it could pick that one up necessarily. It's saying, I've, got a hurry, I've already got ocean water, and it's got all the gunk in it, and the silt and nasty stuff, and now it's picking up all the gunk on the ground and blowing in. And so again, examples can include, I've always felt the intent on this is saying, if it came from a hurricane, it's going to be nasty and it's going to be causing problems. I've talked to two IEPs that I respect very much have said, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of testing. And yes, if flood water hits it on the ground level, 100% category three every time. But we're doing testing on the 14th floor or the 40th floor after a hurricane, uh, you know, from the wind driven rain from that. And we're really not finding a lot of contamination up there. And so there'll be more coming out on this, there'll be more studies on this. Uh, but as of right now, that is, you know, and when I say a weather-related event, hurricane, there's gonna be something you're gonna see on the weather channel, not just that was really windy and stormy that night. So um, I'm not gonna go much deeper to that, but there's a lot, just be aware there's a lot of conversation and you might think, oh, it's, it's a category, it's a hurricane, you know? And so definitely it's category three and you might have a, somebody else that, that might not agree with that. Uh, you need to have that discussion, so. Uh, I just put this one in here, ground surface water. I wanted to, I hear that all the time. It touched the ground, therefore it's category three. That language has not been in there since the 2006 edition. It doesn't mean groundwater is not category three. It just means in essence, it's not automatically category three. It's not given as one of the examples. Um, you know, a little bit of water sprinkler or a hose bib and 
goes down to the basement and gets a couple of feet of carpet wet, does it need to get ripped out or could that be cleaned? Maybe that's category two. So, um, and of course, full protection uh, when you get into category three, because there is some really nasty stuff. And it's interesting because I see a lot of documentation where you'll have a contractor who determines category three, uh, does demolition if it's category three, builds if it's category three, and you start going through the photographs and they're doing all the tear out in sneakers and shorts. <laughs> no PPE. It's like, well, you know, if you really believe it was category three and you're charging accordingly, you probably ought to protect your people accordingly as well. So as we move through what this means, and I, I'm going to pick up the pace a little bit here. 12.1 uh, says, if the if it's category one, then as I mentioned before, you can you don't have to have controls. You can keep moving, which to me says, even though it doesn't directly say it here, it does in other places. It says if it's category one, you don't have to have engineering controls. Even though it doesn't say it, the, the message I get from that is, therefore, if it's category two or three, you do have to. Category one, you don't. Therefore, if it's anything other than that, you would need to do that. And so with category, it, it just says, with category two or three, then you need to re remediate before you dry. Well, you remediate in engineering controls, containments, pressure, air pressure, differentials, all those things you should go forward. So, okay. Um, so I'm gonna just, a lot of information on here just says don't spread contaminants. You can, you know, you can get it, you can track it on your feet, you're rolling dehumidifiers around, whatever, extractors, and you start to move stuff around. Certainly can move through the air, through the HVAC or your air mover. So the, the, never fix one problem, make another problem worse is what I'm getting at. So when you're done with a job, make sure that every tool, every piece of equipment's been completely decontaminated before you move it somewhere else. I wanna just talk quickly about what pressure uh, difference, differential and negative areas. It's simply, it's a control so we don't cross contaminate. So I'm working in the master bathroom and I'm cleaning up some category three water. Well, if I, those microbes are so tiny, they can easily spread to adjoining spaces. So I put in an air filtration device and I vent it to the outside. Well, if I'm removing air from the outside, the surrounding rooms say, well, let us share. You have less air. Here you go. Take some of ours. There's no way for the microbes to swim against that airflow. And so I'm never going to have cross contamination. Um, there's a couple ways to do it. I can push it out or I can pull it out, but I've got to be removing filtered air. Well, I'll talk about that in a moment. I'm going to be removing air from that contained area to do that. I want to be careful. I don't backdraft a furnace flue vent. I don't pull things in from a penetration and crawl space. I'll show that in a moment. Uh, so you've got to be careful with your negative air, but it's a critical part or pressure differential of what we do. So just kind of going through a lot of things real quick. Um, injury controls, we should prevent contaminants from spreading into uncontaminated areas. Yes, absolutely. We should maintain negative pressure. Okay, that's a should. They maintain negative pressure because we're talking about category two. This is actually 12, it's category two or three. If it's category three in grossly contaminated environments, which is category three, then it says we shall do this because now you're getting into OSHA type stuff. And so it, it, two or three, you have to have these in place. Three, absolutely, because now you're getting in to you know, uh, employee protection and things like that. So I, uh, it says spread, this can be accomplished by contaminated areas, containment, and negative pressure. So it says you've got to control it. And here's some ways that you can do that that we're primarily talking about. Um, now, negative air can be accomplished just with an air mover, right? It's pushing air out. However, for most of us, I'm going to be pushing that contaminated air to the outside. I've done it. I've done it on mold jobs out of a, out of a crawl space. As long as that air is not going to the dog kennel, the kitchen window where the kids are playing. So usually you want to have that air filtered. So when it's talking about pressure differentials and negative air. It doesn't state it. But the general idea is it's going to be filtered air, so you're not pushing the contamination somewhere else you know, in the space. I talked about penetrations, living space. You know, if I if I put uh, negative air upstairs and there's contaminant in the crawl space, it can pull it into the living space. So I'd want to make sure that all of those are sealed. If I'm working in the crawl space or in the living space, I want to make sure that I'm not moving those contaminants back and forth as we're doing that. So um, I'm going to talk about a couple of things so you're aware of it. There is what's called an evaluation. An evaluation is what is done by the restorer. And so I'm gonna make one quick adjustment here. And so I go out and I do an evaluation and I say, okay, I look at everything. Where did the water come from? Where did it go? And I say, okay, um, what am I gonna do? What category? What's my preliminary determination? There's a lot of words on this slide. I'm just gonna kind of walk through it. I apologize. And I say, okay, I'm gonna make my own evaluation as I get in there. Uh, pre-remediation, where did the water come from, initial inspection, and potential contamination. That's me doing that. 
And then when I'm all done with everything, I do a post-remediation evaluation. I go through and say, okay, did we get it? I might use an ATP meter. I might use white glove if it's a mold job. I might use a particle counter on certain aspects and say, do I think we did a good job? And that's my own self-evaluation. Um, it does say that on category two or three, a post-remediation evaluation as it should. You have to do that. That's you know, it's just part of the deal. Uh, an assessment is different by virtue of standard language. An assessment is done by an IEP or indoor environmental professional. That's when I call them in and I say, okay, you determine what it is, what I do, and how you're going to clear it when I'm all done with that. So I want to just identify what an IEP is real quick. It's not a designation like a certification you can get. It's a kind of a general overview saying anyone, CIH, IH, whatever it might be, would be an IEP. I'm going to read this slide. It's an individual with the education, training, and experience to perform an assessment of the microbial ecology of a job site, sample the indoor environment, submit it to the appropriate laboratory, interpret the laboratory data, uh, determine the category of water for the purpose of establishing scope of work and verifying return to normal microbial ecology. So we're dealing with IEPs a lot of times. For me personally, this is me with my company. Anytime I had a mold job or category three, my contract stated when I'm done, you will hire an IEP to come check my work because these are microbes that I can't see. And so I'm, I, that's part of it for me is I want to have that comfort level. That's up to you how you do that. Um, if you need to determine that, that an IEP can, can come in. When you say, I've got a conflict, I don't know for sure what it is. They can come in and say, this is what the category is. And then you and your client have some common ground you can deal with. Instead of you say, no, I think it's category three. So that, that, that's an option you have to have them come in and determine what it is. And then afterwards, when it's all done, the post-remediation verification, did I get it back to what it was? And in these following risk factors, if you've got occupants who are high risk and that's not identified what that means, it's typically could be people with chemotherapy or pregnancy or whatever, um, that, uh, that you'd need an IEP or if it's a public health issue. Then it says on category two or three, in these scenarios, you should get an IEP. That would be standard of care. So let's run through quickly what it means on the job with category two. Now I've got category two and three. They, they are very different categories, but really when you see it says in the standard category two and three, what it's saying is category two and above. So category two got to do these things and category three, you have to do these things. But if it's category two, obviously if it's category three, you have to do these things as well. So in that way, it does kind of lump them together, even though they're very different. So category two and three, uh, cushion is gone, carpet pad, is, once it hits category two, Pad is gone, insulation, uh, any insulation at that point is pretty much gone. Uh, duct, you know, ducting inside of a, a, a duct board on insulation, uh, wall insulation, all that kind of stuff, pad. Uh, and I'm gonna get a little bit more into this. If you have any multi-layer floor system and it's got wood substrate underneath it, any but, but hard surface on concrete really, you're losing hardwood, tile, vinyl, everything. Once category two gets underneath it on most floors. I'm gonna talk more about that quickly on a couple of these running through it here in just a moment. So um, category two, uh, cu uh, the cushion's gone, but again, I can save the carpet if I feel it's appropriate to do so. I've got to clean it. Category three, anything category two, plus anything poor, highly porous. So gypsum wallboard, sheetrock drywall, it doesn't matter if it's multiple layers, fire rated, it all has to go once it's been touched. Wallpaper, vinyl or texture, uh, drop-in ceiling tiles, wood paneling, and carpet, among other things. Those, those are gone once it hits category three, according to the standard. Um, so two and above, it just says carpet and pad should be removed so I can look at the substrate, my wood subfloor. With not just carpet and pad, I'm going to move through this engineered wood, plywood or OSB. It says if it's category two or three and it's into the assembly, Surface materials should be removed, and then I can evaluate also to see if I can save my subfloor. Now, category three, I can, according to the S500. There might be instances where I can't, but it's not about the subfloor. It's about getting to the subfloor to dry it and clean it. I want to run through a couple of these really quickly. Vinyl and sheet, uh, vinyl sheet, VCT, LVT, LVP, and all those resilient types of floors. If water has migrated or collected under the floor, finished floor should be removed so I can clean and sanitize. So it's pretty clear, category two and above. Hardwood floors, residential and commercial. If category two water is collected in interstitial spaces under the floor, finished flooring should be removed. Performance sports and dance floors. This one is different. This one says I should look underneath uh, and due to the construction, if it's category two water intrusion, 
then I can get an IEP or other expert in to come in and say, is there a way that we can sanitize this? You've got on sleepers or sometimes some room under there. I don't know if it's because of the value of the floor. However, even on these very expensive dance floors, basketball courts, all that kind of stuff, category three, and it should be removed. So there's a little bit of leeway on a category two, but category three, it still has to go. Engineered laminate floors, all the different types of laminate floors we see, bamboo, cork, parquet. If category two or three water is migrated collected under the floor, it should be removed. That finished floor, so I can clean and sanitize the, the subfloor that's down below it. Okay, this one's a little bit different, so I got more information on here. Solid surface, stone, granite, slate, tile, and marble, all that kind of stuff. If category two or three has migrated or collected under the floor and it's wood, the finished floor should be removed. So all those hard surfaces, category two or three underneath it on wood, it's gone. It does say on here, if it's installed over a concrete substrate, the restorability should be evaluated by an appropriate specialized expert. So when I have a category three on a tile floor over concrete, I call an IEP when I had my company. Call them and say, you look at it. You tell me what to do. Let me confirm that with the client. And then you kind of take, you know, that takes me off the hook for me. Just going, oh, it's category three, rip it out. Well, yeah, but it's all hard surface. And so that's that's the only caveat is if it's hard surface over concrete, because the water itself won't hurt either of those. Although a lot of those hard surface floorings are very porous if they're not sealed and can pull a lot of that moisture in. A couple other things just really quick on this. Elevators. If you're working in an elevator shaft, it says you need to be qualified to do that. But because of all the fluids, hydraulic fluids, which would actually be um, regular hazardous materials, that's a different thing. Trash, debris, dead animals. You're saying when you get to an elevator shaft, a lot of times there's some nasty, nasty stuff going on down there. So probably you're going to consider it category three, unless there's some other contributing factors that might back it off just a little bit. Um, So I got a question, category uh, standard says, standard says generous. Okay, so I wanna point out, they're saying that the standard says on drywall, generally restorable if cleanable. What you're, what I'm assuming you're looking at is the appendix, uh, appendix where it talks about all the different materials. And if you look above that, it says, this is not standard of care. We tried to catch all those, but there still is some. And so, um, drywall, for example, drywall and carpet category two, you have the ability to try and disinfect that and clean it if you feel like you can do it. It's not until it gets category three that those both have to come out. And so where you've got water coming into it, you might be able to physically clean stuff off as well as uh, apply an antimicrobial. Uh, but you're right, because you've got drywall gypsum core and you've got the paper on there. But if you've got, you know, you've got a dishwasher overflow and you think it's right above, you know, just barely into a two and you're okay cleaning it, that opportunity does exist. But don't mix up the, the appendix where it says something's generally cleanable with the standard of care because it, those are two different documents. I hope that answers your question. I'm not sure if I did or not. So fire suppression systems. I see people all the time say, oh, it came from a suppression system. It's category three. There's a lot more information in this section you should read. But basically it says if there's if there's indications of contamination um, or it's connected to non-potable source, then you can consider it category two or three. However, and it, do, it does say in there too, you know, when it first goes off, you can see it's just this black or dark gray, you know, purge come out. It goes, yeah, but that's going to dilute. So, you know, look at that, take that into consideration, not saying what to do or not to do. But if it's on a public supply and there's no additives and you can look at like ethylene glycol in a really old system as regulated nasty stuff, whereas propylene glycol is a food additive. It's probably in the chewing gum you have on your desk right now. So it may not be as bad of a deal on that uh, from what I've, what I've been told by the propylene glycol manufacturers. Um, but it's just saying, yeah, you if it comes from part of the domestic culinary water system, it's circulating through. It's been, you know, it, it does say in here you should get a hold of whoever takes care of it. When is the last time they serviced it? Are there additives? And really find out what's happening with the system. Um, but remember, it's saying if these things are in place, it would be a category one source, potentially. That doesn't mean it can't change very, very quickly. And again, this is where you might want to engage an IEP if you feel that it's a, a higher category than your client does. So cat this language is actually from the 2006 edition. It's no longer in the S500, but it's still pretty good information. Just saying that, you know, you open up a wall and there's a bunch of dead mice in there, then yeah, they're I don't care if it's where it came from a supply line or, or a hoarder's you know, situation, that water flowing through it, even if it came from a supply line, is not going to be a category one any longer. So, all right. Let's see how we're. 
take one quick look at everything here. Okay. Um, this is just saying that, you know, th there's a lot of bacteria and fungus in our environment. It's part of our ecosystem. We, you know, if we didn't have either of those, we'd have dead animals and dead leaves everywhere. That's, that's really part of it. But when it's in the environment and then water's added to a built-in tight environment, then it can become very problematic uh, for the occupants. And that's really our big deal. I'm just going to point out in the S500, we used to have uh, in the 1999 edition, this lovely little chart that shows that after 48 hours-ish, you're definitely gone from a category one to a category two. And really, you know, within five or six days, you're definitely into a category three. In the 2006 edition, uh, that was still right here. And uh, I'm trying to remember if I got that right. And um, they did add some language saying, you know, it really it takes 72 hours for uh, for mold to grow in, in good conditions and bacteria within a few hours in the right conditions. And so a lot of people know, oh, you'll hear a lot of people say after 72 hours, it used to be after 48 hours, it changes. After 72 hours, the only reference anymore to time is time and temperature affect the category. There's no one hour, 48, 72, 30 days, a year and a half. So you've got to use these all these other factors. And yes, time, absolutely. You can say it sat there for 10 days. I think it changed category. Absolutely. It's just not automatically there. And I would strongly recommend that when you make the determination on category, that you don't just say category two. You say a dishwasher overflowed, therefore category two. A dishwasher overflowed, they're in a town for a week and a half. It smelled really bad, category three. Whoever's reading your report might not agree with you, but at least they know how you got there, right? So what category is this? I don't know. Supply line that failed in a clean office an hour ago, maybe a one or a two. Toilet that overflowed came under the wall 10 minutes ago, category three, if it's beyond the trap. So a couple of other quick things. I know I'm up against the clock. I tried to jam too much in here. So bear with me for a moment. Pockets of saturation. If you have a category two or above, then you have to be able to get to the stuff to clean it. And so, you know, drilling holes in the cabinet base. First, I can't, our job is not just to dry, it's to dry and verify. But in category two or three, it's also to um, sanitize, clean. So as it talks about built-ins or cabinets, it's basically saying, if you've got category two, you know, you've got the, the base of the cabinet back behind there. I can't see the drywall, but it's been affected by the water. I need to remove the cabinet to get back there and clean and sanitize. Um, and so just be aware of that I've got to get to where the water went with whatever it is. Um, just realize that there's something else in the water that's regulated arsenic or asbestos or lead or whatever. That's not a category four. It just says, look, if any of these things exist or mold, which is not necessarily regulated or hazardous unless you're in certain states, they're just saying, if you run across this stuff, it gets priority. So someone who's licensed and capable, clean that up first. And then you can move back to your job. And this doesn't necessarily change the category, um, but it just gets top priority. Clean this up first before you go there. So um, never put airflow on any contamination. That's the worst thing you can do. Uh, you know, that, that's why we were so careful with the HVAC system. We don't want to move it around. If it's category two or three and it's gotten into the HVAC system, um, then it might not be possible or practical to decontaminate that ductwork. It might need to be replaced. You need a specialized expert, an IEP and or an assessor from an HVAC company who's able to do that and make those determinations, but maybe just cleaning it won't work on that. And so be aware, um, you've got the NADCA assessment cleaning and, and restoration guide that's out there. The S590 working closely with NADCA will be out soon. That will also address these situations. But that's a big deal. I want to wrap up a little bit just talking about and, and, you know, mold grows and profiles bacteria in the water, but understand, I've heard people say, well, there's, and I'm sorry, you know, there's some, there's some fecal matter poo in the toilet and, um, and, uh, <laughs> you know, it, yeah, the toilet ran all day long while we were gone. The flapper valve came down. It didn't come from beyond the trap. It came from the tank and it just diluted everywhere. Well, bacteria in proper, in the, in the ideal conditions can replicate every four to 20 minutes. E. coli is about every 20 minutes. And it's binary fission, it's exponential growth. One becomes two, becomes four, becomes eight. So if that's happening at like E. coli every 20 minutes, if you got the right situation there, uh, you're gonna have an issue. Just to, just to kind of show how this works and what I'm talking about here. If I have one spore, 20 minutes later, that's two spores. And two hours, three hours later, 256, five hours, 16, Thousand eight hours later, that one spore is 8.3 million spores if this pattern continues. And so it's not diluting, it's actually growing. And that's why it's such a big deal. That's why category two says no feces. 
you know, it, it, category three doesn't say if there's feces, it's us. Category two says if there's feces, no longer us, it's got to go to category three. That's how I read it. No fecal matter in category two. So fecal matter is not category three because category three says it is, in my opinion. It's category three because category two says it isn't. Now, if somebody's dog poops on the carpet, do they rip out the carpet? No, but if their dog poops on the carpet or it's all over the place, it happens a lot and then water flows through it, they might have an impact. If there's a question, you're not sure, you might want to call an IEP. Um, there are toxins. I've, you know, I know that pe people say, well, once bacteria dries, you know, you get a hurricane, you get a sewage, you get under the floor, but if it dries out, all the bacteria is dead and it's no longer harmful. That's outside of my area of expertise. I've done some study that says that some people say that's true. Some people might question it, but that a lot of the toxins might still have the potential impact on health. That's outside of, of, of my point. The standard says, if we got another, we've got to get down there and clean it out again, as I read it. Um, antimicrobials. Uh, again, a whole nother discussion. <laughs> I'm just going to quickly say that the standard says not all uh, water damage uh, you need antimicrobials. If it's category one, which by definition isn't going to make you sick, it's wet, dry it out. Don't be spraying a chemical on there necessarily. Generally not warranted. You might use a static sometime to slow it down, buy some time. But it's just saying if it's category one, don't spray a biocide, kill life on that. Just dry it out and don't allow that stuff to grow and proliferate. If you're going to use antimicrobials, uh, federal, state, government registered, you know, use, use the stuff that, that you should apply. Read the label, follow the label, do what you're supposed to do with them. So I, I know I got moving it toward the back end right there. A um, lot to cover while we're in there. If you've got any other Q and A's, I think we're right up on the clock. And so uh, anyhow, really thank you so much for joining us. I hope you, I hope, at least I know it's moving pretty quick today, but thank you for being here. Uh, after class, you're getting an email with a link to this recording. So if you signed up and put in your IICRC information, we will send that to the IICRC for CE credits. Um, it's also, if you watch the recording, it's set up where you can do that as well. The, in, the email will have some information on other classes. Uh, we just added subrogation self-directed. So if you need that, we've got it in there. Uh, we're giving away a Matterport uh, access this month. And so uh, there's some information on how to get involved with that. And then just uh, hope you'll follow us on social media. Anything else you need? Um, thanks for being here. And we'll get some more information on the email also on our next uh, webinar series that's coming up. So thank you so much, everyone. I hope you have a great day. Read and follow the standard, get to know it uh, and follow it. Thanks so much, everyone. Take care. Have a great day.